Hello everyone, I'm Holly. Um, lovely to meet you and um, I hope that today um, one of my main aims is you're going to be able to take something um, away from what I say and that it can inspire you. Um, I am on my 20th year uh, doing this thing called supporting small businesses. And so I was 27 when I started Not In The High Street and I'm going to be turning 47 um, this, oh gosh, actually in two weeks time. But um, I, one of my things that I've realised is that I think that I've been put on this planet to inspire people. Um, I think that might be on my gravestone. Um, so what I really do want to do is try and give you just my knowledge and my experience and, and let's see what that does for you. Um, let me take you back. This is the younger Holly. Um, I have a podcast called Conversations of Inspiration and I ask every single one of my guests to write a letter to their younger self. And I'm nearly on my 200th episode. And so this is me when I was little. Um, I didn't actually realize that my mother started a business doing personalized bedding, which would have been good for the PR story if I'd actually realized that for the first 10 years of Not in the High Street. Um, but she created, um, back when I was four years old, um, a small business. Um, I was a girl that liked to know what I was giving as a present, quite annoying for anyone with children. You sort of just give them the gift, don't you? But actually, even from a young age I was caring about what I was giving um, and always when I do my podcast actually you can tell every single founder that's been on my podcast the journey starts when they're a child um, I was to further to the right there there's me inventing the recycling bin um, I was young engineer of Great Britain um, can't remember the year but I invented a recycling bin and I actually thought my whole career was going to be in bin uh, creation, whatever that is. Um, but luckily enough, it didn't kick off um, and I avoided that. Um, there I am with the late Queen. I was head girl um, of my school, but um, I wasn't goody two shoes all the time. I, the year before that, I was nearly expelled for a certain evening with a swimming pool, maybe some illegal alcohol being brought in. Um, to, and actually, I say to my son, who's now 19, look what mum did in one year. You can turn your life around. So um, luckily, he hasn't done anything like a silly mother. And here I am at 17. I started um, life. Um, I call it the University of Life. I went to publicist advertising agency. And I uh, celebrated my 18th birthday in the office. So I'm coming up to my 30th year in work. Um, then, because my nickname is um, Holly Hurricane, um, actually, I got married um, very, very young. I don't recommend it to anybody. Actually, my son's coming up to the age that I nearly got, ma I, I got married. Um, so I got married at 21, divorced at 23 to my childhood sweetheart, um, and uh, also found out I had a brain tumour. So the whole thing sort of started coming around, and I was thinking, my goodness, you know, um, what's my life going to... Um, involve in the future, um, but I was 23 years old. So um, what you do in a crisis, um, or what I did in a crisis, was I created um, vegetable wreaths. And uh, it sounds odd, I don't recommend it to anybody, um, but I created vegetable wreaths. And the reason I did that is I was a creative soul. And I was a creative soul, so as I was going through a bit of trauma, I decided I was going to get busy with my hands. If I hadn't gone to publicist, I was going to do a degree in art. And um, I started putting these wreaths together. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to reinvent the world of wreaths um, because it needs to be reinvented. And I put on, I thought, well, actually, I need to sell my wreaths. Um, where can I sell them? I, I'm living in Chiswick. I'm going to sell them at the local Christmas fair. And funny enough, there wasn't a local Christmas fair. And I thought, well, how hard? I'll create the fair and then I'll have the best trestle table at the fair. And that sort of all made sense to me. So I did that. I put on the first Chiswick Christmas Fair. Um, I'm sure you might not remember it. It wasn't a big deal to anyone outside of Chiswick, um, but it was electric. So I pulled together all these small businesses under the town hall roof and I put on the first fair. I then decided after that, sod the wreath business, I'm out of here. I am going to go into the events business and pull together small businesses under one roof. 
So I created a company called Your Local Fair, where there I was. I mean, I don't know why it's in a tiger. I think this is because it was the cheapest uh, fancy dress outfit I could find. And I got someone to hand out leaflets up and down Chiswick High Street. But what I did is essentially pulled together all these amazing businesses. I curated them. But my venue was a town hall um, roof. Um, but you can imagine what I'm going to say. That was the idea behind um, Not On The High Street. How could I put on a 24-hour day fair on this thing called the internet? Because it was going to be a big thing. Now, we were in the stage here. Dial-up modems were still a thing. Um, social media was not a thing. Um, I, Because I was Holly Hurricane, I'd found my uh, love of my life, who, thank goodness, I'm still with after 22 years. Um, I had my son, Harry, and I, I put on my last fair, and I was like, right, this is it. Internet, small businesses, curation. There's got to be something in this. So I got together with my old boss, Sophie, from Publicist Days, and we said, right. And I will always remember, I wrote her an email, and it was in 2005, and I said, but basically what we're going to do is pull everything, and it wasn't a thing at the time, not on the high street, and pull it together. And that's history, really. That was the moment. So there I am, um, uh, typing away, trying to pull these small businesses um, together. And actually, it was a whirlwind, because we're talking 2005, I've got a three-month-old baby, and absolutely, um, there was nothing to copy. Um, no one had ever done this before. Um, we sort of didn't, add, I think back to it, we didn't really concentrate on the fact that no one else had done it. Um, the only other marketplaces out there was Amazon, and it sold books. There was eBay, which you would flog your nan's, you know, crappy socks that she'd given you for Christmas, and you just call it nan socks for 10p. Etsy wasn't invented. And there was Little Not on the High Street with two women with absolutely zero retail experience, no tech experience. We've been in the dot com boom and, and done something there. But we didn't, what we did have though is that we were consumers. And we were consumers and we wanted to find better. So, um, so how hard was this going to be, right? And I'm telling you right now, it was so hard. Um, because the um, just things that we take for granted now. So we would say, I don't even want to say this because I haven't really checked this out. I'm just thinking about it. I remember calling eBay up. This is how naive. And Richard Branson, by the way, just called his office, thought he'd maybe take a phone call to give us some money. Um, but I remember calling eBay in America saying, you've got this thing called like a single basket technology coming out. Because up until this point, you would check out with individual sellers. And I said, any chance you want to <laughs> sell it to us? Obviously, I didn't get through to anyone properly. Um, so we invented single basket technology ourselves. Two women, no experience, inventing that technology, which allowed our small businesses to sell under one roof, one basket. Nothing like this existed. But the thing was, is I was selling to small businesses who had never sold online before like this. So I, they were asking me questions. Um, do I need a computer to sell on your website? Hmm. Yes, probably. A printer? Yes, a printer as well. Um, and I would basically, in a good way, I'd stalk them. So I would have this um, system. Um, you know, there was no such thing as Trello in those days. It was good old fashioned ring binders. And I'd go through my list, A to Z, and I'd find the small business I absolutely wanted. And even if it took two years calling every single week, I would speak to them until they said yes. And then these people are still dear friends with me. 20 years on, they say, God, I'm so glad I ended up joining Not On The High Street. Some of these people ended up doing, well, I'll talk about that in a minute, pretty well. So we basically were trying to pull things together. If anyone's ever done a startup, it's a complete nightmare. My, my tip is employ your family. They feel guilty. Um, they're cheap. Um, they work so hard. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. But what I did do at that stage, even though we couldn't afford the heating in the offices, I bought the URLs across the globe. And I always had that sense, you know, anyone that believes in what they're doing, I knew that not on the high street as a concept was a worldwide problem, not just a problem that I was having in the UK. I would go to my bank managers when we ran out of money, because we ran out of money all the time. 
And I said to him, I will re not rename the bank. Listen, if you give me some money, I will give you some shares in my business. I will give you my shares. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Um, he didn't know what a marketplace was. He didn't even know what an entrepreneur was. Um, nor did I, really. Um, but what I'm trying to do is take you back to anyone too young to remember the lingo wasn't out there, right? There wasn't seed funding, angel capital, et cetera, et cetera. So when we went out to go and raise money, um, we were just so naive, two blonde women with their bags full of all their um, personalized dinosaur t-shirts. And we would go into the knocking onto the doors of the VCs who would quite frankly just tell us that their wives did the shopping. And isn't it lovely that you're going into the world of craft? And are you going to be operating from your bedroom? And we would just, it was just such a different type of world. The only thing that has remained, by the way, is that, uh, what is it, 2p in every pound gets invested into female-founded uh, female businesses still today. And I've been doing this for 20 years. So can you imagine what I was invested? It must have been sort of like 0 0.0005 or something. So it started slow, these two blonde women who didn't know much about uh, um, online selling and this whole thing. It started slow, but we did start to grow. I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the things I've learned between Not in the High Street and now my new business, Holly & Co. But let me just finish off the conclusion of Not in the High Street. The little old dream ended up pumping one billion pounds into the economy, billion pounds into our 5,000 sellers. Um, it's helped out grow over 5,000 small businesses. 900 to maybe 1,500 now, I don't have the up-to-date figure, was a million pound partner. So that person that I was stalking, I was going to say to you, some of those people that I stalked ended up doing a million pounds TTV um, every single year. So um, I then um, decided that um, it was my time to go. And I, it was very difficult. No one talks about how difficult it is for founders to exit their business because actually you've given birth to a company. So I have Harry, my son, and my first business, I have one son that's real, the human flesh, and then I have another one, which is my small business, um, not in the high street, which was my first business baby. And now I have Holly & Co, second one. So I had to pick myself up as a mother of this company and really understand what I was going to do. What was my next calling, so to speak? So I founded a company eight years ago, roughly, called Holly & Co. And what the mission was is to help everybody start a business doing what they love. Because I had been in this wonderful bird's eye point of view, watching all these 5,000 businesses who all thought they were taking a single journey themselves that was unique to them, but what I could see is it was very similar to everybody else. And yet, where were they going for inspiration and advice? Where were they seeing that actually business was colorful? It was emotional. It was soulful. It was creative. Because guess what? The government's website definitely wasn't giving that impression. And I still don't think actually you know, anyone else does a, a very good job of it. So I was on a mission. Let's rebrand business um, because it is incredible. So for the last eight years, that's exactly what I've been doing. When I started my podcast four and a half years ago, there wasn't a single female founder that was successful who had a podcast in business. So I started Conversations of Inspiration. As I said, I'm about to record my 200th episode. I have an advice hub where anybody can come and get ungoogleable uh, business advice. Um, so it's all the bits in between the bits that you can Google, um, which are very, very important, just like life. I actually had a shop for seven years because I wanted to understand what it was like to have bricks and mortar and not just be um, someone that was representing online sellers. Um, Instagram, social media, you can follow me. I also then realized no one was campaigning for things that mattered. You know, no one was campaigning for the independent high street. No one was campaigning that people should vote with their money because we should vote with the money for the world that we want to live in. So again, we were just asleep at the wheel. We created the independent awards, the largest awards that were just literally pure and good, uh, giving away a hundred thousand pounds cash to small businesses. I wrote a book called Do What You Love, Love What You Do, Sunday Times bestseller. Again, micro chapters for people who want to really understand about business, um, not in the black and white pages, potentially that my male counterparts have written. And I've also done events called Congregation of Inspiration, where all my events are held in churches. 
um, and I will have amazing choirs um, come through the churches and inspire us with incredible speakers because actually running a business is quite a spiritual thing. It's a soulful thing. So this is now the world of small business that I represent. And hopefully what you'll see is I like a bit of color. Um, and I do think it is a joyful thing. I think it's incredible. I want to inspire more female founders to start a business. Because if we did and had the parity with men, 250 billion pounds would be pumped into the economy within four years. And so I felt that something needed to happen. Um, but there was one jigsaw piece missing in my world. Um, and I was so excited to put it in. So if you think about Mr. Cabri, he had a factory, didn't he? And he then built a village around his factory for all his workers because he knew that Mr. Cabri knew, it was very, very forward thinking, that he had to create almost like a village for people to operate in, to believe in what they were doing. And so 22 weeks ago, my husband said, you are nuts um, to do this all again. I launched um, my very own new marketplace. So I think I'm the only woman or a person in the world to have created two marketplaces supporting small businesses. And my aim now for the next, I've said I'm going to retire when I'm 90. Um, the late Iris is a role model to me. I'm going to get become more eccentric. This bow is going to become bigger and bigger on my head. Um, drinking wine, bigger glasses, who knows what's going to happen. But I'm going to turn 47, so I have a huge amount of time in front of me to do something about the things that matter to us. So my aim is to help women be the fullest versions of themselves. So I've created the home of small business. That's what I call Holly & Co, the home of small business. Um, where we have incredible co's, Holly and Co. Um, the co's are one of, I would say, the unique top, top one, two percent of small business in the UK. We've been called the Liberty of Small Businesses, the Independent Anthropology, and the website that should become with a warning, um, which I qu quite like. Um, we are looking at less ordinary product. We are all about bringing soul to retail, bringing, and actually, when you go onto the site, I don't have enough time to explain, but I like the idea that consumers, so if you can imagine, for eight years, I'd been looking at B2B. And what I think is, how many consumers do you think want to start a business? Far more than who have. So what I wanted to do is open the doors to our consumers and say, guess what, you love what you buy, but have a look at the videos on the site. Would you like to also start your own small business? And could Holly & Co contribute to decreasing that parity between men and women starting businesses? And by the way, all through, great product. Um, and we actually have an actual house, a four-story house that you walk into and every single room represents one of the departments which is my living, breathing studio. So if you follow me on Holly Tucker, you will see that I have so much activity. Think of it like Big Breakfast for anyone that can remember that. QVC mixed with a bit of Martha Stewart. That's the vision. So again, this has never happened. If I said I was going to do it again, it wasn't all going to be in 2D because actually I needed to bring it to life. And so this today is my Holly & Co world. It's a world where I'm very, very proud. I feel like even though I've been doing it for eight years, I have a team of 20, um, absolutely I have just begun. So today I wanted to maybe share with you before you have this wonderful day with the most smartest people um, that I could never even begin to compete with. But I'm just gonna try and lay some foundations with some of the things I think I know to be true this time around. And one of the things was, I remember once, you know, as you build a business, as you can imagine, with six VCs, um, a C-suite, all from the best names you can imagine, um, you know, being a founder, being a female in that environment um, can lead to the imposter syndrome. And I remember someone saying to me, Holly, you know what? This business is just far too emotional. And I found myself apologizing for that. I found myself going agreeing, thinking that's what I should do. I should agree that this business of massively female-led business that was so passionate about what they were doing um, was too emotional. 20 years on, I would say that absolutely, Holly & Co, number one thing that we are is emotional. I am looking for emotional connection, emotional commerce, that's exactly what I'm doing. If my target audience is women, 
they spend 80% of, of the disposable income. And if I ask them, tell me one brand that you shop with in a utilitarian way and you feel something about. Actually, let me ask you, ladies, a business that you shop with, okay, or you transact with and you feel part of it. Anyone? Okay, so once someone said boots because I buy tampons from it, I was like, God, that's so not emotional connection. I mean, we get emotional, but it's not emotional connection, right? But actually, the thing is, is how appalling is that if you think about it? How are you shopping and um, transacting and actually you're not feeling part of anything? So my mission, when I asked a thousand people that, and I didn't, I was actually asking a thousand people because I wanted to know this information, no one could tell me a single brand. And so that is my mission again here with Holly & Co, to be building something extremely focused on emotion, extremely focused on consumers and co's and bring them as part of the journey, not the journey, a mission. You know, we're mission first and shopping second, mission first and then helping women um, thrive. Because I believe this emotional connection is absolutely fundamental. At 27, you know, I didn't realize that. I did instinctively, but I buried it. And so what I would just say is so much of us in our day-to-day -day lives, don't we, in our jobs, we know what we're doing. But actually the thing is, is that if you dig beneath that, what really would work? If you were going to re-look at your jobs or think about things, what would really work? Not what you do, not what you've done for the last 10 years. And so that is what I do every single day. I'm trying to test myself. Because out of the 30,000 decisions that we make every single day, 5% of our decisions are rational. Okay, so 95% of our decisions are not rational. So again, when we think about emotion, actually emotion is a very, very commercial thing, a commercial commodity, but also it is a joy of life. And so actually now when I'm doing this, this second time around, I'm thinking about word of mouth. I'm thinking about storytelling. I'm thinking about advocacy. I'm thinking about lifetime connection. You know, and when I'm talking to my small businesses, my co's and those who follow me, I'm really asking them not only to think about the utilitarian side of what you guys are dealing with, but I'm also asking them to understand the power of a story, the power of their story. I was recently, um, I do pharmacies, uh, pharmacies where I help people with their ailments and I'm Dr. Tucker, bear with me. And I basically had someone talk about, you know, they, they just can't seem to get their social media to work. And this very, very wise gentleman called Dan Kennedy, um, who's actually written a do book called um, Do Start, said, well, my number one piece of advice is, are you the most you you've ever been? And she was like, uh, uh, definitely not. Um, because if we all think about it, are we the most us to everybody? No. And she said, absolutely, I'm not. And he said that that's the one piece of advice I will give you. The businesses that succeed or the, the way that, um, especially if your founder succeeds, is if you're the most you um, that you can be. The next thing I would like to say is that there is no such thing as a silver bullet. And I couldn't not put you sure underneath just because I, I, I'm going to tell you there's no silver bullet. But secretly, we always keep looking for the silver bullet. I think that's the game, isn't it? Um, and actually, in the first 10 years of my existence, I always looked for the silver bullet. It was the one thing that was going to just, you know, suddenly turn me into Richard Branson and I was worrying about the island I was buying. You know, I just was looking for what that is. And I wish there was that silver bullet. And it, it was coming in a new hire. How many people have, you know, hired someone and thought, this is it? It's all going to change with this hire or a new agency or a new social media channel or um, it, what, what was it that was just going to break my world and my existence and it was going to do something that propels me into um, another uh, atmosphere. And the thing is, is that actually there is no silver bullet. Um, there is no silver bullet. It's accumulation of things. 
And actually, it's about learning and driving and testing, not being scared of new, going in there with both feet, but also being will willing to let go with love, being willing to be wrong. You know, this big, the W word, we call it. You know, I, I like to fire myself every single week at Holly & Co. I actually tell my team, fire yourself, please. Because if you're not firing yourself, you haven't royally fucked up somehow, then definitely you aren't testing things. So again, when we have people who are young coming into our company, that's how I like to lead by example. And I believe that preparation and opportunity as a, a, as a, a connection equals miracles. And that is definitely what I have seen to be true, because as much as and, you, you know, take it, uh, you know, definitely I understand um, what we're doing, how to build a marketplace, all the elements that you need when you have two consumer bases and what technology you need to use and, um, and what technology you need to advance with. I think it's the little things that ultimately fuel success. So if you're competing in a crowded landscape and you think that by just doing the same things other people do um, is going to make you succeed, it's incorrect. Because this time around, it's actually refreshing knowing there's no silver bullet. So even though the team wants to definitely throttle me every time they're like super excited about something, I, I, I don't totally you know, kill their excitement. But I do help them understand that even though this is brilliant, this isn't going to be the answer that the whole company is going to rest on because you won't want that because there is no silver bullet. And actually, it's that risk, isn't it? It's spending that, you know, um, spending money as an online business on, for instance, catalogs, looking at the paperweight of that catalog. Um, maybe it's hard to put the ROI on that. But actually, do I know that women um, want to gain post in their post boxes that aren't bills or whatever? You know, we don't get a letter, do we? But actually, maybe a catalog, maybe a, um, a, a magalog even. Is that a word? I, I think it's like 1980s now. But anyway, I'm bringing it back. Um, so yes, it's all about that combination of things that we can do to engage with, us, uh, with our audiences. It's the mix. And that's absolutely what I know second time around. Um, one of the first agencies that we worked with, um, I remember not in the high street, one of their, their, their greatest um, pieces of advice was that we should call not in the high street, not, Just not, because not would fit on a phone right because the logo you know it's like hey it's just eat and there's uber so it should be called not i was like do you think that that's a good idea to call not on the high street not uh, i just don't know if it's going to take off thank you for laughing yeah that's what i did as well and actually you know the 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 iconicness of our um what someone would call unmodern logo was what made it iconic um, the fact that it had history, the fact it wasn't falling into the app designed um, logo that we can all just whiz through. Um, so the other thing I wanted to share with you, and this is something that is just really top of my mind at the moment, which is about being in a cycle. So uh, a, bit, a little bit like the silver bullet, I continuously at Not In The High Street, continuously try to solve finalize almost my life's mission, which was to scale the unique. So these are two words, by the way, that shouldn't even go together, should they? Because obviously you can't, you can't scale something that's unique. But actually, and, and it pissed me right off that I'd even thought about it, because then once you know something, you can't unknow it. And I spent my whole world trying to solve the problem of scaling the unique. And the thing now I realize is that this is the puzzle, the game I'm in, until I'm 90. Actually, it wasn't there to be solved. That was my challenge for a lifetime work. How can I scale the unique? How can I take a ton of small businesses that do all these most amazing, unique things and help them grow their business and grow their teams, and maybe they're going to go into manufacturing, and how do you not lose what that person and that product was before? because it's easy to get caught into the trap of the next thing. You know, people ask me my next thing. Well, God, I've just gone and done it again. I don't have a next thing. I'm just going to do it better. So actually, now I think about it, although we were built for women, by women, supporting creativity, 
all we were doing really, when I think back at Notton High School, was just chasing the la latest technology because we needed to do what other people were doing. That was the whole point. And I forgive Marcel because we were backed by, you know, six VC funded tech businesses. And I was a Google tech woman of the year and all this sort of stuff. But the point is, as I got rid of the three spanks that I would wear on a daily basis to go into the office, running to the toilet with my PA, high heels, looking like the person that I was meant to look like, I've actually realized that one of the things what one of my investors um, who, uh, who's with me still today said, Holly, the thing is, is that she's left the building. Now, how was that even possible under my watch? <laughs> how was it possible that we were built by women for women, 98% of our customers were women, 98% of our uh, partners were women, and yet someone said she had left the building. So again, it's just a lesson that I now take with me going into my next business, Holly & Co, which is actually you can focus on the focus for a lifetime and that could be great work because you're never completed if you have such a mantra as scaling the unique. Another thing um, I learned to be true, everything, by the way, I know it all sounds a bit uncomfortable. I'm going to do another uncomfortable one. It is great, by the way, being an entrepreneur in a small business. Um, but the thing is, is that actually these are the things I wish someone had told me, which is that normally, you know, when you're standing on the balcony, so I always ask our team to get on the balcony, get off the dance floor now and again, is that you need to, we all want comfort, don't we? We all want the, the sort of world that exists and it just operates. And the thing is, is that I know that when you're in the right place, you're sitting on this rather uncomfortable concrete seat. That the more uncomfortable you are, the better it is for your business. So again, you know, when I started Holly & Co, all I was chasing for in a way was, ah, oh, I've done not in the high show, I'm doing not Holly & Co, it's going to be okay because I know what I'm doing. And the moment I felt comfortable, I realized, hang on a minute, you are not living to your full potential here. You are not taking every opportunity. You are not getting to that sort of place where you know you're right when you're on the outskirts of your capabilities, when you're sort of floating like an astronaut around your capabilities. That's when you know, when you feel you're most uncomfortable, this is when you are living. And I know that either um, you know, you, you, you think about the moments and you think about how much we chase it. And an amazing guy called Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, who's the uh, black farmer, and I've done a great podcast with him. And it's basically people are addicted to certainty. And he said to me, Holly, I want you to make uncertainty your best friend. Do not be terrified of it. Be its friend. And that will allow you to break things, to fix things. You know, it will allow you to go on that gut instinct, which is your internal compass. So all of these things, just this week, I've completely broken the model of Holly & Co. Some of my team who are sitting here today don't even know what I've done, but I've broken it because I sort of, it was all coming a bit too easy, which meant that it wasn't different enough. It wasn't actually going to be scaling the unique. And one of my final points is the zone. You know, I think about not in the high street and I think about Holly and & Co. And I think about this flow state and actually this sort of um, heightening this focus and creativity. And actually, the thing is, is are you being the best version of yourself? You know, th this is the point I live every single day. Every single day I think about death. I think is today my last day. My husband can't bear it, by the way, because he's not one of those people. And I'm like, darling, do you live in gratitude? He's like, oh, shut up. You know, but I live in gratitude every day. Every single day, I think, if this was my last day, am I in my flow state? Am I doing what I love? Am I actually pushing things forward in only the most unique way Holly Tucker can do? And actually, I would say for the last three weeks, I am. And I'm in this moment, you realize, don't you, when you're in that moment of flow state. And so actually, this is what I'm bringing the world of business, talking like this, um, speaking in this sort of a way that's soulful and spiritual, because guess what? That is what business is like. Business is not as we know the dragon's den. It is not the apprentice. It is not the daily lies. You know this as well. It's where alchemy happens. 
it's when you're on the edge of your capabilities. You know, and I was talking to somebody who was an artist this week, and we were talking and they were like amazingly painting in front of me and I cannot paint for, for love nor money. And he said, but Holly, you do have a canvas of your life. You have a canvas of business. What you're doing in business is you are painting. You are creating a new version, a vision that only you can see. And it's going to be a masterpiece. And I absolutely loved that analogy. Because actually, if I go back to the beginning, if I go back to that girl tucked up in bed, if I go back to her who wanted to do art, who wanted to be creative, I am using all those muscles. I might have got an E in business studies A levels, which you know just adds to the story. Um, but the point is, is I am creating. And as I said, I live with this. So on my 40th birthday, I decided um, to work out, because I love efficiency as well. This is one of my things. So I love efficiency. So on my 40th birthday, I was like, how many days have I got on the planet? Because I just need to sort of know how many I've got left, because I've got lots to do. So I worked out that I had 29,000 days on the planet. And at 40, I only had 14,000 left. Now, let me not leave this as a depressing point to you all. I want you to go and work it out, because actually, it's amazing. Because every single day now, I realize that one of my days is counting down. How am I going to make it count? I live in gratitude. I'm so grateful, by the way, to be speaking to you all today. I really mean it when I hope something I've said has resonated with you and that you can take it with you because that matters to me because this is an important morning for me. Um, I'm going to leave you with a video um, which is going to play and, um, and then I'm going to open the panel, uh, the panel, the, the, the audience um, for questions. So let me play something for you. The existence, the physical universe is basically playful. There is no necessity for it whatsoever. It isn't going anywhere. That is to say, it doesn't <clears throat> have some destination that it ought to arrive at. But, but it is best understood by analogy with music. Because music, as an art form, is essentially playful. We say you play the piano. You don't work the piano. Why? Music differs from, say, travel. When you travel, you are trying to get somewhere. In music, though, one doesn't make the end of a composition the point of the, compos of the composition. If that were so, the best conductors would be those who played fastest, and there would be composers who wrote only finales. People go to concert just to hear one crashing chord, because that's the end. <laughs> Same way in dancing. You don't aim at a particular spot in the room. That's where you should arrive. The whole point of the dancing is the dance. Now, but we don't see that as uh, something brought by our education into our everyday conduct. We've got a system of schooling which gives a completely different impression. It's all graded. And what we do is we put the child into the corridor of this grade system with a kind of come on kitty 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 and yeah you go to kindergarten you know and that's a great thing because when you finish that you get into first grade and then come on first grade into the second grade and so on and then you get out of grade school you go to high school and it's revving up the thing is coming then you're going to go to college and by joe then you get into graduate school and when you're through with graduate school you go out to join the world and then you get into some racket where you're selling insurance and they've got that quota to make. And you're going to make that. And all the time, this thing is coming. It's coming. It's coming. That great thing, the, the success you're working for. Then when you wake up one day about 40 years old, you say, my God, I've arrived. <laughs> I'm there. And you don't feel very different from what you always felt. Look at the people who live to retire and put those savings away. And then when they're 65, they don't have any energy left, they're more or less impotent, and uh, they go and rock in an old people's senior citizen's community. <laughs> and because we've simply cheated ourselves the whole way down the line. <clears throat> we thought of life by analogy with a journey, 
with a pilgrimage, which had a serious purpose at the end. The thing was to get to that end, success or whatever it is, or maybe heaven after your death. But we missed the point the whole way along. It was a musical thing, and you would first sing or dance while the music was being played. Thank you very much. Thank you.